All right, so now we're going to take a look at our deeply branching bacteria. Uh, so we've talked about the gram-negative, the gram-positive, uh, we've talked about uh, phototrophic bacteria, and now we're going to talk about deeply branching bacteria. So uh, on a phylogenetic tree, as we've seen in previous chapters, the trunk or the root of the tree represents a common ancient evolutionary ancestor. Uh, they often call this the last universal common ancestor, uh, Luca. And the branches are its evolutionary descendants. <clears throat> so I'm going to scroll up just a little bit so we can take a look at that while we're talking about it. So recall when we studied the phylogenetic trees in previous chapters uh, that we have this down here, right? This is the beginning here, the oldest ancestor here. Uh, and then it's going to go up and branch off uh, depending on where they're split, specifically in DNA, since now we use DNA to determine where on a phylogenetic tree we are going to place things. So scientists consider the deeply branching bacteria, such as the genus Acetothermus, to be the first of these non-LUCA forms of life. So the LUCA ones are down here, saying this is some form of uh, beginning bacteria, our common ancestor. So the last universal common ancestor, meaning everything else has branched from this. And then they're saying that when we look at what branches right after that, we see something like acetothermus. Uh, and to be, it's, so it's the first non-LUCA life forms. And we can see that on this uh, phylogenetic tree is right here in this star, the acetothermus. So you can see it's the very first branch um, off of this right here. <clears throat> uh, they believe that it was produced by evolution some three and a half billion years ago. Uh, when placed on the phylogenetic tree, they stem from the common root of life, deep and close to the LUCA root. So this guy down here. Hence the name deeply branching. So it branches deeply on this phylogenetic tree of life. So remember these are our domains here, bacteria, archaea, Eukarya. So we've been talking a lot about bacteria in this whole chapter. We'll briefly get to archaea in a moment. And then we've been talking about all of these different uh, species here. We're going to talk about aquifex in a moment. And then we're going to talk a, a bit about our acetothermus right now. <clears throat> so our deeply branching bacteria, uh, they believe may provide clues regarding the structure and the function of ancient and now extinct forms of life. So some of those LUCA. So uh, since they are so closely branched off of that universal um, bacteria down there, universal ancient uh, organism, we think that that may be, scientists think that that may provide clues as to what that is. So uh, we can hypothesize that ancient bacteria, like the deeply branching bacteria that still exist, were thermophiles or hyperthermophiles, meaning that they thrived at very high temperatures. Uh, so we're not talking about just warm liking or hot water. We're talking extremely hot, extremely cold temperatures. So Acetothermus pausivirans is a gram-negative anaerobic bacterium. So gram-negative anaerobic without oxygen using bacterium discovered in 1988 in sewage sludge. So it's a thermophile. Uh, growing in an optimal temperature of 58 degrees C. So scientists have determined it to be the deepest branching bacterium. So the one that's closest to the evolutionary relative of the LUCA. Uh, so our deepest branching. The class Aquificae uh, includes deeply branching bacteria that are adapted to the harshest conditions on our planet. Uh, so resembling the conditions that scientists think dominated the earth when life first appeared. Uh, so bacteria from the genus Aquifex are hyperthermophiles. So where we see hyperthermophiles would be places like hot springs, and that's at a temperature higher than 90 degrees C, we're talking about like 200 degrees plus here, um, 200 degrees Fahrenheit plus. And the species uh, A. pyrophilus thrives near underwater volcanoes and thermal ocean vents uh, where the temperature of the water and under high pressure no less can reach 138 degrees C which is uh, more than 200 degrees C closer to 300 so or uh, Fahrenheit sorry Aquifex bacteria uses inorganic substances as nutrients so things that are not organic for example uh, pyrophilus can reduce oxygen 
and is able to reduce nitrogen in anaerobic conditions. So when there isn't oxygen present, then it can reduce nitrogen. They also show a remarkable resistance to ultraviolet light and ionizing radiation. And these are some of the observations uh, that support that hypothesis that these ancient ancestors of these deeply branching bacteria uh, began evolving more than three billion years ago. So when the earth was hot, uh, when it lacked an atmosphere, so it was exposed to ultraviolet light, uh, when it was exposed to non-ionizing and ionizing radiation. So they think that things like the Aquifex bacteria um, directly descended from this bacteria and have evolved uh, and have been around for three billion years when the earth was hot enough for these temperatures to exist all of the time uh, and having ultraviolet light hit them and ionizing and non-ionizing radiation because there is no atmosphere. Uh, the class Thermotogae is represented mostly by hyperthermophilic as well as some mesophilic, meso meaning moderate uh, temperatures, anaerobic, so without oxygen, gram negative bacteria, whose cells are wrapped in a peculiar sheath like outer membrane called a toga. It's been named a toga. So thermotoga, um, thermatoga, is uh, that class that is wrapped in a toga. <clears throat> so uh, the thin layer of peptidoglycan in their cell wall has an unusual structure because it contains diaminopimelic acid and D-lysine. So it's a little bit different. Uh, these bacteria are able to use a variety of organic substrates and produce molecular hydrogen, which uh, can be used in industry. So since it produces hydrogen, it can be used in industry. Uh, the class contains several genera, of which the best known is the genus Thermotoga. <clears throat> One species of this genus, uh, Thermotoga maritima, lives near the thermal ocean vents and thrives in temperatures of 90 degrees C. Another species, Thermotoga subterranea, lives in underground oil reservoirs. So again, these are archaea, are things that we find in extreme conditions and in, in very different areas where we wouldn't think that things are able to live. So underground oil reservoirs um, and temperatures near thermal ocean vents. Some are mesophilic, which means that they prefer moderate temperatures, but many of them um, can, as we mentioned up here, can survive ionizing radiation and UV light and all of these conditions that a lot of other bacteria are unable to um, handle. Uh, so when we're talking about um, these bacteria, we're talking about some very ancient, very old, and very different from many of the other bacteria, and these deeply branching bacteria. Finally, uh, the deeply branching bacterium Deinococcus radiodurans belongs to a genus whose name is derived from a Greek word meaning terrible berry, uh, also nicknamed Conan the bacterium. So D. radiodurans is considered a polyextremophile because of its ability to survive under the many different kinds of extreme conditions. So this guy can survive extreme heat, extreme drought, a vacuum, acidity, and radiation. All of those things, extreme of all of those things. It owes its name to its ability to withstand doses of ionizing radiation that would kill all other known bacteria. So this special ability is attributed to some of the unique mechanisms of DNA repair. So there is a, a picture there of uh, the most incredible, strongest um, bacteria that we know, this Deinococcus radiodurans that can survive the harshest conditions on, on Earth. So everything that we've been able to throw to it or throw at it, it has been able to withstand. All right, so then lastly, we are going to lump this part in so it's not so short of a lecture and talk about archaea. It's another short section here, finishing up the chapter. So we've talked about all the different types of bacteria. Uh, this chapter are the, the prokaryotic organisms, so bacteria and archaea. And we've already talked about all the different types of bacteria that you should know. And now we're going to talk about the archaea that you should know. <clears throat> So like organisms in the domain bacteria, uh, archaea are all unicellular organisms. However, archaea differ structurally from bacteria in several ways. 
And we've already talked about that, but we'll just uh, read this little summarization here as a reminder. <clears throat> so the first one, the archaeal cell membrane is composed of ether linkages with branched isoprene chains, as opposed to the bacterial cell membrane, which has these ester linkages with unbranched fatty acids. So remember the unbranched fatty acids are uh, these guys here that don't have branches, all part of the plasma membrane are, are lipids. And then in our archaeal cell membranes, we have ether linkages as opposed to ester linkages. And then they have branches in their chains rather than these, these straight chained lipids. Uh, archaeal cell walls lack the peptidoglycan that we often talk about when we talk about bacteria. Uh, but some contain structurally similar substance called pseudopeptidoglycan or pseudomerian. Uh, the genomes of archaea are larger and more complex than those of bacteria. So those are just to summarize some of the differences between archaea and bacteria. So domain archaea is as diverse though as the domain bacteria. So there are many, many different kinds. Um, they're very diverse and its representatives can be found in any habitat. So you can find archaea all over the place. Some archaea are mesophiles, so meaning that they can live in moderate temperatures and many are extremophiles, so living in those extreme temperatures <clears throat> in extreme situations. Uh, so extreme hot or cold, extreme salinity, or other conditions that are hostile to most other forms of life on Earth. So we're talking about things that are very extreme. Uh, their metabolism is adapted to the harsh environments and they can perform methanogenesis, uh, for example, which bacteria and eukaryotes cannot. Uh, methanogenesis is genesis or making methane. So the size and complexity of the archaeal genome makes it difficult to classify. So most taxonomists agree that within archaea there are currently five major phyla. Uh, so you need to know these different five phyla of the archaea. So there's Crenarchaeota, Euryarchaeota, Corarchaeota, Nanoarchaeota, and Thaumo. Archaea, or Thauma Archaeota. <clears throat> Thauma Archaeota, that one's difficult for me. So uh, there are likely many other archaeal groups that have not been studied uh, and classified, but those are the five major phyla that you should know. Uh, with few exceptions, archaea are not present in the human microbiota. Uh, there's one that we know of, and none are currently known to be associated with infectious diseases in humans, animals, plants, or microorganisms. Uh, however, many play important roles in the environment and then may have a direct or an indirect impact on human health in that way. So we'll start with our Krenic archaeota. Uh, the Kren archaeota is a class of archaea that is extremely diverse, <clears throat> contains genera and species that differ vastly in their morphology and requirements for growth. However, all Kren archaeota are aquatic organisms so living in the water, and they are thought to be the most abundant microorganisms in the oceans. So the most abundant microorganism in the oceans are Kren archaeota, which are domain archaea. Most uh, Kren archaeota are hyperthermophiles. So some of them are able to grow at temperatures up to 113 degrees Celsius. So hyperthermophiles, extreme thermophiles, uh, notably the genus Pyrolobus. Archaea of the genus Sophobus, Sophobus are thermophiles that prefer temperatures around 70 to 80 degrees C and acidophiles that prefer a pH of 2 to 3. So uh, Sophobus is one that you need to know of the archaea, the Crenarchaeota. Sulfolobus can live in aerobic or anaerobic environments, so with oxygen or without oxygen. It can live in the presence of oxygen or in the presence of oxygen. Sulfolobus species use metabolic processes similar to those of heterotrophs. Uh, so in the presence of oxygen, what we see is something like it utilizing carbon sources to metabolize. In anaerobic environments, so when there is no oxygen, they're able to oxidize sulfur, hence the name sulfolobus, sulfur, to produce sulfuric acid. 
which is stored then in granules within the archaea. Sulfoloba species are used in biotechnology for the production of thermostable acid resistant proteins called aphetins. Uh, these aphetins then can bind and neutralize various antigens, which are molecules found in toxins uh, or other infectious agents, and then they promote or provoke an immune response in humans. So they can use these aphetins to then kind of um, coat those antigens and then not provide a, a rem an immune response in the human. All right, so sulfolobus. <clears throat> And here we go. Here is an image of Sulfolobus, an archaeon of the class Cranarchiota. Oxidizes sulfur and stores sulfuric acid in its granules. <clears throat> Another genus, Thermoproteus, is represented by strictly anaerobic organisms. So Thermoproteus are only anaerobic organisms with an optimal growth temperature of 85 degrees C. They have flagella and therefore are motile. So thermoproteus is able to move around because they have a flagella. Thermoproteus has a cellular membrane in which lipids form a monolayer rather than a bilayer. So remember when we were talking about proteins, we have this bilayer. When we talk about eukaryotic organisms, we have a bilayer, a membrane. In this case, we have a monolayer. So mono meaning one layer rather than bi meaning two layer. Uh, which is typical for archaea. Remember, that was one of the differences as well. <clears throat> its metabolism is autotrophic, which means it uses very simple um, molecules in its surroundings in order to metabolize. Uh, so to synthesize ATP, a thermoproteus species reduce sulfur or molecular hydrogen and use carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide as a source of carbon. So Thermoproteus is thought to be the deepest branching genus of Archaea, and thus is a living example of some of our planet's earliest forms of life. So Thermoproteus are deepest branching Archaea, um, and so er, some of the earliest forms of life can reduce sulfur or hydrogen, molecular hydrogen, and can use either carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide for carbon, or yeah, for carbon. All right, then we have our Uri Archaeota. So Uri Archaeota, another phylum of Archaea, has several distinct classes. So the species in the classes, Methanobacteria, Methanococci, and Methanomicrobiota represent Archaea that can be generally described as meth methanogens. So as you can imagine, methanogens are able to reduce carbon dioxide in the presence of hydrogen and then produce methane. Methanogens can produce methane using carbon dioxide along with hydrogen. Uh, they can live in the most extreme environments and can reproduce at temperatures varying from below freezing all the way up to boiling. So methanogens have been found in hot springs as well as deep under ice in Greenland. Some scientists have even hypothesized that methanogens may inhabit the planet of Mars um, because of the gases that are produced by the methanogens resemble that of the Mars atmosphere, the Martian atmosphere. So methanogens are thought to contribute to the formation of anoxic sediments by producing hydrogen sulfide, uh, making marsh gas. So if you've heard of marsh gas, uh, like a methane type of gas, then they think that this is because of these methanogens. They also produce gases in ruminants and in humans. So we do have one uh, methanogenic archaea that we know of in the human body, which is uh, Methanobrevibacter smithii. Um, and, and M. smithii is one that we see sometimes in the human gut that contributes to gas production, methane. Uh, most often we see them though in ruminants that have high amounts of gas. You can think of cattle, for example, have lots of gas, a lot of methane, um, and so we see archaea there. Some genera of methanogens, methanogens, notably methanosarcina, can grow and produce methane in the presence of oxygen, although the vast majority are strict anaerobes. Uh, so again, our methanogens 
Uh, most of them are anaerobic, so without oxygen. However, mentioned here, methanosarcina can grow and produce methane in the presence of oxygen. Uh, the class halo or halobacteria, sorry, different one, halobacteria. Uh, as it notes here, named before, there's a distinction between archaea and bacteria. So even though it has the name bacteria and it, it's not bacteria, uh, it's an archaea. So the class halobacteria is actually archaea. Um, includes halophilic, which is salt-loving archaea. Uh, so halobacteria require very high concentrations of sodium chloride in their aquatic environment. Uh, the required concentration is close to saturation at 36%. So if you can imagine the most amount of sodium chloride, of, of table salt that you can put in water and, and stir it up and stir it up and stir it up until nothing else will dissolve in that water, um, then we get to the point where halophilic or salt-loving archaea or halobacteria can live in that. Uh, such environments include the Dead Sea as well as some salty lakes in Antarctica and South Central Asia. Uh, so very few places that have that type of situation. One remarkable feature of these organisms is that they perform photosynthesis using the protein bacteriorhodopsin. So these guys that can live in the Dead Sea, that can live in salty lakes in these extremely salty situations, uh, the halobacteria, can also perform photosynthesis. Uh, so they have the protein bacteriorhodopsin, uh, which gives them and the bodies of water they inhabit a beautiful purple color. Uh, so if you look at this here, <coughs> you can see uh, this really beautiful purple color that comes from having the halobacteria in there. So halobacteria growing in these salt ponds and gives them that nice purple color. Notable species of halobacteria include halobacterium selenarum, uh, which may be the oldest living organism on Earth. Uh, scientists have isolated its DNA from fossils that are 250 million years old. Another species, Halopharyx vulcanii, shows a very sophisticated system of ion exchange, uh, which enables it to balance the concentration of salts at high temperatures. Uh, so again, since it's a halobacteria, Halopharyx vulcanii, we're talking about high concentrations of salt, and it has this uh, sophisticated system we won't get into um, of ion exchange so that it can kind of balance the salts that it's in as well as the extreme high temperatures. All right, so that is the end of this chapter of chapter four. I recommend reading through this summary, kind of refresh your memory on all of these things. I also recommend going through the chapter tables and learning that information. Um, so looking at the tables in the chapter, going back into the paragraphs, reading the information so that's clear in your mind. I also recommend, at least for my style of learning when I was going through these things uh, several years ago, that um, I really liked having flashcards. So I definitely do recommend flashcards, writing down the, the species, the genus, uh, whether it's bar uh, bacteria, RK, gram positive, gram negative, all of those things, uh, just to kind of get those things in your brain, kind of going through them. The repetition is good um, to, to really understand what these bacteria are and then how they relate to humans. So we often, we went through the chapter and we talked about ways that the, these examples are pathogenic to humans, some how they help humans. Um, so it's important that you understand these things because this is, this is the world that we live in, remember? And the, our bodies alone it could be up to upwards of 10 to 1 microorganisms to human cells. So this is what we're here to understand. <clears throat>